Welcome to the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Wednesday, February 26, 2020. Uh, today on our agenda, we have Senate File 3496, Senator Matthews. Welcome to the committee, Senator. When you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members, for giving me this opportunity. I have before you Senate File 3496, and uh, I have an author's A1 amendment, Madam Chair. I believe that should be in everyone's packets. I'm getting a head nod. Yes, and so I believe it's This is to uh, just clear up. We worked the phrasing of the bill over a couple of ways, and the A1 amendment is to uh, uh, make the language clearly state our intention with the bill. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Um, any questions, members? Senator Matthews moves the author's A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Senator Matthews, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill is to um, strip back from the Pollution Control Agency their ability to set uh, the clean air standards solely with regards to uh, the California standards. And then the end of the bill has a $1 million study uh, for studying the economic impact of what applying these standards would do to Minnesota. So this is an important bill for a number of reasons that I'd like to get into and then call a couple of testifiers up to share their perspectives as well. Uh, we had a hearing on this issue last week where we uh, uh, clearly had two differing sets of opinions as to uh, the reason for this proposal going forward and what its impact will be on Minnesota. And uh, first off, I'll continue uh, to push that uh, the rules as proposed as the agency is working on forming is uh, an unconstitutional violation of separation of powers, that uh, policy directions are given to the legislative branch and, uh, and the uh, executive branch and their bureaucratic agencies are not to be the ones uh, solely through rulemaking setting public policy points forward through in Minnesota. Uh, additionally, uh, many statements were made back to the statute. And so if you look, members, at the statute, uh, which is even contained around in the, in the bill itself, uh, the many sections of existing statute are there. Um, and the, the 1967 legislature, when the statute was enacted, could not have meant an interpretation this broad to reach all the way to dictating the types of cars driven in Minnesota. You'd be hard pressed to convince me otherwise that that was the attempt based on the members that served here in this body at that time. And uh, I believe it was even stated last week that uh, the legislature could uh, make that clarification and rein that power back in, which is what this bill is seeking to do. So this overly broad interpretation of one line out of the statute here in section 116.07 uh, is dangerous, especially when it is also violating about four or five other lines that are in this very same statute. Members, I'd like to call your attention to lines that are in here, such as lines 1.8. This is already in statute saying the agency is supposed to do this in the most practicable way possible. I call your attention to 1.2 and 1.3. This is also current law. Uh, they're to recognize variable factors that no single standard is applicable to all areas of the state. I'd like to appoint you to 120 and 121. This is existing law pointing out that what is, in, what is good in a residential area may be different from what needs to be the standard in an industrial area. And 1.22, which states that they're supposed to base these on scientific knowledge of causes. And uh, it's been clearly shown on uh, both sides have brought up uh, what 
they believe their scientific studies have shown, and uh, it's not exclusive uh, to the agency and only the science that they have is what uh, rules the day. So members, I wanted to point you out to what is already an existing law and how uh, this agency is going to attempt to just cherry pick one line out of statute and use that as their justification for moving forward on this overreaching rulemaking. Uh, this also violates the commitment that Governor Walls made in his inaugural address when he uh, clearly stated that he would respect the authority of the legislative branch as a co-equal branch of government. And uh, this push here is going in the opposite direction of that, of choosing to circumvent the legislature and do this through rulemaking. Uh, the, the rulemaking proposals seem to be more one California than they do one Minnesota. Um, the rulemaking that they are attempting uh, appears to fail the if the shoe fits on the other foot test, as I like to call it. If the roles were reversed and a person in the governor's mansion was of an opposite persuasion, something this drastic, maybe a rulemaking effort to do away with electric vehicles, um, would be justified by the precedence that is set by this administration. And I don't think that would be appropriate either. Uh, therefore, um, I want to highlight that for the current rulemaking process we have today. Uh, you'll hear more from testimony how um, the rulemaking uh, being proposed will likely cause at least an $800 increase to the cost of all vehicles here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, members, I'd also like to point out uh, the missed opportunities of the Pollution Control Agency. Uh, they decided to use this process through rulemaking rather than going through the legislature. And since the hearing last week when many of this was explained, I've sat and thought about this and realized uh, there were a number of missed opportunities that could have been taken uh, to address what probably is a legitimate need. Uh, if there are barriers to certain products, certain electric vehicles being able to be available in Minnesota, I think there would have been a bipartisan uh, coalition in our Senate uh, to look at that and see if there was a way that we could remove legitimate barriers to make products available here in Minnesota. Uh, but that opportunity was never even presented to us. Uh, instead, this route was chosen, uh, which is going completely around us. Uh, and last week, I thought it was very interesting when I asked the commissioner directly if they had considered uh, doing this via a bill rather than going through the rulemaking process. And to be honest with you, I expected the answer to be no. And so I was a little bit taken back when the commissioner said, actually, yes, we did consider uh, using this going the legislative route and instead chose to do rulemaking. And thinking about that uh, since last week's hearing, I've come to the conclusion that almost seems worse than just admitting, than, than if the answer had been no, that they had just only considered the rulemaking, because that makes this seem like it's a purely political decision, not even attempting to go through uh, the legislative branch of government. And uh, it was very disappointing to hear that response that it was considered and yet rejected. Um, the agency is supposed to be taking their direction from the legislature and not the other way around. And in conclusion, members, I want to read a letter that was sent to me. I've contacted constituents. I called up uh, a person who runs a Chevy dealership in an, uh, the small town of Foley in my district. Uh, his name's Chad Murphy, and I invited him to come and testify today. He could not uh, make uh, today's date work in his schedule, but he sent a letter that I want to read to you here. I want to give you a perspective of a one of these businesses that would be impacted by the proposed standards, because this goes to the heart of a small town business uh, in, a, in the rural areas of Minnesota. Chad writes, my family owns the local Chevy dealer and I am the third generation involved with the business. I'm concerned about the California car proposal because I don't think the government should be dictating what I sell. 
auto retailing is a consumer-driven business, and we stock what consumers demand. That's why we've been in business for 90 years and are able to provide 28 local jobs. If I don't have a particular vehicle on the lot that a consumer wants, I will try to find one from another dealer. If Minnesota has a different standard than the surrounding states and vehicles here cost more, I will have difficulty trading vehicles with dealers in other states. This puts me at a disadvantage and will make it harder to serve our customers. When the Chevy Volt came out, a hybrid plug-in, we invested in the infrastructure required by GM to sell them. With the launch of the Bolt, that's Bolt with a B, Chevy's all-electric vehicle, we opted not to because the cost of additional chargers, special tools, and training far exceeded what we anticipated we could sell. Again, this was a business decision made based on the market in our community. And EVs are not the only kind of vehicles dealers make these decisions about. Not all Chevy dealers opt to sell the iconic Corvette. They don't make the investment because it isn't right for their market. These rules will change the supply and cost of cars available in Minnesota, but they don't guarantee we will be able to sell them and may reduce the choices customers in our area want. Thank you for giving me the time to voice my concerns. Chad Murphy with Murphy Chevrolet in Foley, Minnesota. And I wanted to share that with you so that you would all get a perspective of that. And uh, just to wrap up, Madam Chair and members, I believe that it's irresponsible uh, for the PCA to cede our authority uh, to California and trust California bureaucrats over Minnesota legislators. And that is the reason why I'm bringing this bill forward today. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you for your indulgence. And I'd like to invite our testifiers to come up and uh, share their perspective on this bill as well. Thank you, Senator. And I believe we the first two on the list are uh, Amber Backus and Isaac Orr. And <clears throat> testifiers, I, I do want to remind you that we had an extensive hearing on the Clean Cars Act. And so we are not hearing the Clean Car Bill today. We are discussing Senator Matthews' bill. And so uh, when you come up to testify, we'd like to be very short and succinct. And please address your comments to the bill and not the overall line Clean Car Act. So thank you. With that, Senator Matthews, who would like to go first? Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association and its 373 franchise new car and truck dealers located across the state of Minnesota. And I won't repeat um, a lot of the testimony I shared this week, but speak to this specifically. And we do appreciate Senator Matthews bringing this bill forward and engaging the legislature in a dialogue about the California car proposal. While I'm not in a position to speak to the agency's authority, we are disappointed that the Waltz administration has decided to unilaterally pursue adoption of California's auto emission standards without a vote of the legislative branch. And while we appreciate the multiple opportunities for dialogue the agency has provided, they cannot adopt Minnesota-specific changes based on the feedback they receive during the hearing process. Nor does this rulemaking process allow for the state to make investments that could really move the electric vehicle market forward much more than a mandate, such as incentive programs. And while the agency must produce a statement of need and reasonableness to justify the rule, we believe the study in section two of Senate file 3496 would be much more valuable. If we look to Colorado, which was the most recent state to adopt California emission standards and is providing the model for Minnesota's action, their regulatory, regulatory analysis failed in a couple ways. They did not determine how the difference between divergent federal and California standards would impact vehicle sales. And one of the reasons the MPCA is pursuing this rule is so Minnesota can have a different st standard than the federal government. Having a study like is pr um, proposed in the bill would allow the economic impacts of the difference on the automotive marketplace to be thoroughly explored. And while Colorado acknowledged that all vehicles for sale in the state would be more expensive, they decided these increases would not cause a drop in sales. The Colorado model assumed that customers would willingly pay more and sales would increase in that state by 3% every year. We don't think this assessment would hold up here, and I'd like to refer to you a handout that was just passed around. On average, Minnesota dealers sell around 10% of their vehicles to customers outside of the state, with some individual dealerships relying much more on sales to customers in the Dakotas, Iowa, and Wisconsin. 
Higher vehicle prices here will wipe out those sales and potentially those dealerships that depend on out-of-state sales for over a quarter of their business. Does the MPCA have the expertise to evaluate these various scenarios? And as you heard from Senator Murphy, I'd like to re reiterate how important dealer trades are um, to our business. But in Colorado, when they did their economic analysis, they took a pass on analyzing the cost of the rule on those dealer trades. And it's a very important tool for our members to use to help them manage inventory and locate a vehicle for a customer seeking a specific color and trim package. Because of the increased customization of vehicles, some franchise dealers, like Cadillac, rely on dealer trades for as much as 50 to 60% of what they sell. It's impractical and too expensive for them to have every possible configuration of a vehicle on their lots. If the surrounding states don't have the California LEV certified vehicles, those dealers will have nothing to sell their customers, jeopardizing their entire business. Section two of the bill provides the resources that will allow a more thorough vetting of the impacts of the rule to be studied and not constrained by the MPCA's limited market expertise. This kind of thorough economic analysis could also examine the impacts on transportation revenues in the state, which are woefully short of what's needed to fund our roads. The impacts of more efficient vehicles on gas tax revenues, the modeling of lost new car sales on motor vehicle sales tax revenues, the possibility of snowbirds buying and registering their vehicles outside of Minnesota could all be studied, giving policymakers a full view and ability to weigh the economic benefits and hardships of adopting California's policy. For these reasons, we'd respect respectfully ask the committee members to support further study of the proposed rule so that all of its costs are fully vetted and considered before its adoption. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, members. Are there questions? Thank you. Next testifier, please identify yourself and welcome. All right. Thank you. Hello, my name is Isaac Orr, and I'm a policy fellow specializing in energy and environmental policy at Center of the American, uh, Center of the American Experiment. Our name is too long. Uh, just going to say that. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on this bill. I think this bill will have a positive impact for all Minnesotans by limiting uh, MPCA's ability to impose unpopular California car mandates for low emission vehicles and zero emission vehicles in the state. Uh, because if implemented, these rules would impose large costs on Minnesota families and businesses for negligible environmental benefit. Um, so I, I covered this in our uh, quarterly magazine, uh, Thinking Minnesota, for the winter edition. I'm also the author of the center's 27-page uh, comments to PCA on this. So when it really comes down to this, I think that it's important for the study to have some outlines, because right now it's, it's a giant $1 million slush fund. So if we can direct the agency to look at more specific things like Amber was talking about, I think that that's a really good thing. And I think that the agency should have to justify this rule uh, one of the reasons that they say that we need this rule is because of consumer choice. Uh, they often argue that we have to adopt these rules because there's a huge demand for the models of electric cars that are not currently offered in Minnesota. But survey data from the Renewable Energy and Electric Car Advocacy site, cleantechnica.com, shows that there's virtually zero demand for the EV models that are not currently offered in Minnesota and that these talking points are wrong. Uh, the first thing to know about the electric car market is that it's 1.6% of the total car sales in the country and that it is utterly dominated by Tesla and nobody else is even close. Uh, of all the EVs sold last year in 2019, 63% uh, of them were the Tesla Model 3 and Tesla accounted for 78% of EV sales in 2019. Uh, the Chevy Bolt, the most popular non-Tesla EV, was only 6.7% of the EV market. So when we're looking at the study of the economic costs, you know, if we're going to be mandating uh, that dealers stock cars that people do not want, that's, a, that's an opportunity cost for them. They have to purchase these cars from the manufacturer. It says deliver for sale. So that's, that's a big thing. People say, well, we don't need to sell these cars. But that's not, that's not really true. And I'm sure Amber can speak more to that. Uh, so each and every one of the top eight selling EVs in the nation can be purchased by going to the Tesla website or looking at cars.com. I did this in a 30-mile radius of my house in Minneapolis, and you could find all of the top eight selling cars. Um, it could be argued that these cars are the biggest sellers because they're more available than other sources of EVs, uh, but the Clean Technica survey does not support this argument. Uh, basically, uh, it said it pulled current EV drivers and asked them what model of EV would most, they would be most likely to purchase next. Uh, overwhelmingly, Tesla. Those were the, the biggest ones. Uh, the Chevy Bolt, the Nissan Leaf, and the Hyundai Kona constituted another 21% of the would-be EV market, and all of these are available in the state. 
Uh, of the cars on the survey that were not available were the Kia Nero and the Kia Soul. Uh, and that was 7% of people, of current EV buyers, said that's the car I want next. So right now we're looking at imposing large costs on all Minnesotans for the 7% of the 1.6% of people who are interested in buying this, this Kia. So if they want that, uh, I would argue that it is not worth adopting California's mandates for the sake of these, these folks. Um, also when it comes to consumer costs, it would be really good if this study looked at the fact that uh, GM does not expect electric cars to be profitable until sometime this dec or early this decade, so 2022, 2023. Uh, so requiring the dealers to stock money losing cars is going to have them shift the cost to other people. Uh, the MPCA says $800, but Colorado said it was going to cost somewhere between $1,200 and $2,800. So having the you know having it written in this you know funding request for the million dollars to look at this, examine the assumptions, I think that that's really important um, because as it stands right now, if there is a state where the consumers prefer trucks rather than cars, it'll take 11 years before these benefits would, or these regulations would provide a net benefit in gasoline, uh, I guess lower gasoline spending. Um, and the average car in Minnesota only lasts for 11.8 years. Uh, so you, the, the cost benefit you know, calculation here is very tenuous, especially because oil prices are probably going to remain low because the United States is the world's largest producer of oil. Um, and uh, the, the problem with EVs is they're probably going to be more expensive than traditional vehicles uh, for the next 10 years. This is from an MIT study, Massachusetts Institute, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, and they said that they may never reach the same sticker price so long as they rely on lithium ion batteries, the energy storage technology that powers most of today's consumer electronics. So batteries have been coming down in cost. I think MPCA should look at this, obviously, when they're looking at the, the economic cost with this million dollar study. But they should use the M or MIT's numbers. Uh, because I think that that's a pretty reputable organization. Uh, so MIT believes that the electric vehicle declines will slow as the steady decline in the cost of lithium ion batteries slows as they reach the limit set by their raw materials. Uh, this is to quote the MIT study. If you follow some of these other projections, you basically end up with the cost of batteries being less than the ingredients required to make it, said Randall Field, executive director of mobility at the MIT uh, Mobility of the Future group. We see that as a flaw. Boy, that was a polite way to say that, wasn't it? Um, and also, I think when we're looking at the cost-benefit analysis, obviously, uh, the, the costs are going to be economic. That's going to be dollars and cents. But if uh, we're going to have this study, uh, it should also have to quantify what the environmental benefits are. And I think in order to do that, you need to clearly say what the temperature impact of these rules are going to be. I think that Minnesotans need to know, we're going to spend this much money, but what are we going to get for it? And the uh, using the exact same... Uh, I guess methodology used by the Obama administration when they were doing the clean power plan. Uh, basically, that was the most or sweeping uh, climate change regulation that Obama enacted. Uh, it would have the clean power plan would have averted uh, 730 million metric tons of CO2 annually, which would have averted 0 0.19 degrees C by 2100, which is an amount too small to be measured. Um, so, if you use that same idea. Uh, this would avert 2 million tons, which is about 0.27% of the amount that would have been averted by the Clean Power Plan, meaning this will probably reduce global temperatures by 0 0.000052 degrees C uh, by 2100. And lastly, I'll, I'll stop after this, uh, the, the study should look at the, the impacts on uh, low-income and minority communities, because they're going to be the ones that are going to be the most likely to be impacted by this, also rural communities. Um, and it should be known that there is a group of civil rights activists in California called the 200 that are suing the California Air Resources Board, which is the exact agency that we would be taking our, our marching orders from if we implement this rule, that said that it is ha there that these that uh, basically CARB's climate policies are having a disproportionate harm on the poorest residents, particularly Latinos and African Americans. Quote, California politicians are using anti-racist environmentalist words to hide the regressive impact of their climate policies on the poor and people of color. Uh, the suit that is against CARB claims that it is in violation of the Fair Employment and Housing Act and that the, the policies guarantee that housing, transportation, and electricity prices will continue to rise. So I just think if we're looking at all the economic impacts of this, that should be outlined in the study. Thank you.
Thank you. Members, are there questions? Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Craig McDonald and Frank Kolash from the MPCA. Welcome to the committee, gentlemen. Who would like to go first? Madam Chair and members, my name is Craig McDonald. I serve as Assistant Commissioner at the MPCA, and I'll be providing testimony, but we are happy to stand for any questions that you may have. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 3496. The, MPCA, the MPCA's mission is to protect the environment and human health. It is a mission we take very seriously. When the legislature granted the MPCA the authority to regulate air pollution in 1967, it gave the agency the ability to tackle tough pollution challenges that adversely impact the state. For more than 50 years, the agency, under control of Republican, Independent, and Democratic administrations, judicially uses this authority. The MPCA today continues to use very targeted and strategic approaches to addressing pollution. Our clean car standards rulemaking has been a transparent and open process. We've had six meetings across the state and seen over 1,000 people attend. It addresses one of the toughest challenges for the state, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution from the transportation sector. On-road vehicles emit 24% of statewide air pollution, as much as all permitted facilities combined. Vehicles emit nitrous oxide, volatile organic compounds, and particulate matter, which contribute to ground level ozone formation and cause significant health impacts. These health impacts include higher rates of asthma onset and aggravation, cardiovascular disease, impaired lung development in children, and premature death. The health impacts are the most severe for people in environmental justice areas. Studies by the University of Minnesota and the MPCA, as well as other researchers, have found that while communities of color and lower socioeconomic status tend to own fewer vehicles, do less driving, and use public transit more often than other groups, they're also exposed to higher levels of traffic-related pollution. This is because busy roadways and their associated pollution often run through their communities. In addition to the health impacts of traditional air pollutants, vehicles are also a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota. Passenger vehicles emit approximately 18.5% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the state, and these emissions are not decreasing fast enough to meet the goals of the Next Generation Energy Act, which was passed in 2007 in a bipartisan manner. Although vehicle emissions have decreased due to federal standards, the federal government is now proposing to roll back these standards. This bill would limit Minnesota's ability to reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. It prevents Minnesota from doing what is best for Minnesota. In summary, Madam Chair, we oppose this bill. As with all MPCA rulemaking, the legislature always has the ability to weigh in on these rules and to make the changes it deems necessary. This has been a process for more than 50 years and should remain the process moving forward. Again, we thank you for your time and are happy to answer questions. Members, are there questions? Senator Sengem. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question. Uh, this, uh, this provision in the law, I think, goes back to the uh, creation of the MPCA. To your knowledge, uh, has, the, uh, has the MPCA ever enacted uh, any other laws relative to uh, auto emissions related to the, the privilege that this particular provision within the law gives them? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Sinjim, um, the MPCA uh, one time did have vehicle emissions testing, which was done under these general rulemaking authorities and our ability to regulate air emissions. Um, for a deeper analysis, I might ask Frank Colash, but to my knowledge, we have not used these before. But again, we have been working with the federal standards. Currently, the federal standards used to be harmonized. The federal standards are now being proposed to roll back. So we're proposing to move forward with the standards that we were planning on to protect Minnesotans. Senator okay, Sinjim. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. P perhaps uh, his uh, partner might, uh, <laughs> if he has any additional information, might offer it. Okay, he does not. So I'm fine. Thank you. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you mentioned the 2007 goal. And I guess my concern is, is you know, we, we establish goals all the time, and many times we reevaluate those goals as we go forward. Can you... Uh, if not for the goal that we set back in 2007, would we not be adopting this rule? Mr. McDonald. 
Madam Chair and Senator Howe. Um, climate change is something that threatens all of us. We are not seeing the reductions in the transportation sector that we need to you know, confront this challenge. And so it's important that we take actions in this sector to reduce those emissions. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so you've got direct correlation that, that auto emission standards in this country is a direct correlation and is causing the climate change. And if we correct and fix our, our and we fix the car emissions problem, will fix the climate change. Is that what you're telling me here today? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Howe, um, greenhouse gas emissions occur in all sectors. Nationwide, the transportation sector is the leading emitter of greenhouse gases as well. So it's an important sector to focus on to make sure that we're reducing those emissions in that sector. And that will help drive us towards meeting the reductions that we need. Senator Howe. Well, I, I will say that at the last hearing that we had here, I asked for the places that you took the data that uh, said where you collected all this information for the study you conducted, that you collected this data of auto emission standards all over the state. I'm still waiting to see that, uh, that, that information and where those collection points are. I'll be looking forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Lane. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Excuse me. Uh, Commissioner, as, as you said a couple of different statistics here. The 24% of all emissions come from on-road uh, vehicles and 185 and a half from passenger vehicles. I'm assuming you're talking about the difference between semis and heavy hauling vehicles and cars, correct? Uh, Mr. McDonald? Madam Chair and Senator, I will let my colleague Frank Kolash talk about those figures. Mr. Kolash. Madam Chair, my name is Frank Kolash. I'm climate director with the Pollution Control Agency. And to those two statistics, we are looking at two different types or sets of air pollutants. The 24% number refers to air pollutants that we refer to as criteria air pollutants. Those are the uh, types of air pollution that when you breathe them, they can cause uh, specific health problems and that they can also lead to the formation of fine particles or ozone or smog in the atmosphere. So those are the 24% the refers to that set of air pollutants. The 18.5% refers to the proportion of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, that passenger vehicles and the vehicles that would be addressed by the clean cars rule uh, emit relative to greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Senator Lang. And back to the commissioner, mm -hmm. you mentioned that the, the intent is to reduce the amount of emissions um, you're not seeing the reduction of the emissions as the clean air standards from 2007. How, how much? How much are we going to reduce those emissions? Mr. McDonald? Madam Chair and Senator Lang, we are working on that to refine that as part of the statement of need and reasonableness, which will be included in the sonar when we publish. But initial estimates are that we would see a reduction of potentially approximately 12 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in the first 10 years. Senator Lang. And do you think it'd be a good idea to do a study on that? Mr. Madam McDonald. Chair and Senator Lang, that is part of the study that we are conducting as part of that sonar. Would the, would the additional $1 million that Senator Matthews is talking about here help that? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Lang, we are confident in the analysis that we've provided and will be providing in the sonar for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Senator Lang. And you talked, uh, later on you talked about all sectors and the fact that we're talking about a very small sector of emissions. I, well, Maybe 18 and a half isn't that small of a sector, but uh, are you considering moving into different sectors, semi-trailers, electric, uh, electric tractors, combines, anything like that? Madam what's Chair the, and the Senator, statement? the proposal will be focusing in on those passenger vehicles that we've talked about in clean cars um, to focus in on that and implementing that. Do, do you have Senator. any future intent, future, thank you, Madam Chair, any future intentions of going into different sectors? Madam Mr. Chair McDonald. and Senator, we are continuing to work on the clean cars proposal, which does not affect those. Thank you, Madam Any other questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as uh, it's been uh, offered that, uh, quite frankly, solar panels offer, uh, I think, uh, emit, uh, is that nitrogen trifluoride into the atmosphere uh, just by being there and being used. And that nitrogen trifluoride is 17,000 times worse than carbon dioxide. 
Are you monitoring the effect that solar panels has uh, on our air as well? Mr. Mandano? Madam Chair, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Colash to discuss our greenhouse gas inventory and all the gases that we monitor. Mr. Colash. Madam Chair, Senator Weber, I'm, I'm not uh, aware that we are including that term within our current emissions inventory. I would have to get back to you as far as whether or not that is part of our study and what the magnitude of those emissions that we understand those, but those not are cur currently part of our greenhouse gas emissions. We do look at the emissions from the other uh, high potential super warming gases as they're, they're commonly called, but they're primarily refrigerants that are used in manufacturing processes and refrigeration processes. Those are included in our uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Senator Weber. Have, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for example, can you give us an idea of the readings of the air quality in the metro area here that in the last 20 years, uh, what kind of increases has there been in the elements that you're testing for? Mr. Kolesh? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Weber, because of multiple regulatory structures, especially on uh, large industrial uh, facilities that need air permits, we've seen uh, improvements in air quality significantly over the last 20 years. The challenge that we continue to face is that as the health sciences continue to uh, delve into the, how air pollution affects health, we continue to see the standards at the federal level being driven downward. And so we have continued to see our, for example, ozone or our smog concentrations be about 90% of this, the federal standard, and we're concerned that some of the science is out there indicating that it sh that standard should be lower, which would put us in violation of that standard. We would need to seek the reductions in the types of pollution that the Clean Cars Minnesota proposal would look at. For fine particles, we've continued to see uh, levels going down. For nitrous oxide, we've seen levels going down. So for across the suite, for most of those, those um, those pollutants, we've seen them go down, but that's been uh, primarily on, on the backs of improvements in the permitting system from the industrial sector and also the improvements in efficiency in, in vehicles that have been made so far also and, uh, and consumer products. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. When you talk about, uh, you made a reference to uh, the sciences, which Specifically, which sciences are you talking about as, as it relates to establishing uh, the, the testing procedure you're using? Mr. Kolesh. Madam Chair, Senator Weber, those are the sciences primarily based on epidemiology and the understanding of the connection between exposures to uh, various environmental agents and health, but also the toxicology and understanding how these agents act once they are within a person's body, how they may affect asthma or uh, obstructive pulmonary disease or heart disease, and understanding all of the, the various um, medical medicine, toxicology, and epidemiology about how the, the particular exposures to air pollutant drives people's health and also exacerbates existing conditions that they have. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. You indicated that the emissions had gone down. By what amount have they gone down? Mr. Kolash? Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Weber, uh, I can refer you to the Air We Breathe legislative report that the Pollution Control Agency uh, published and submitted to the legislature in 2019. We can provide that to you. Uh, uh, that will provide the exact numbers for each of the, the major air pollutants that we would have and, and talk about where we've been going with the emissions. Senator Weber. One last question. Can you, just for purposes of today, can you give a, a, a broad guess as to what percentage-wise we're talking about? Mr. Kolesh. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Weber, I, I, I don't want to just make a guess right now because it would depend on which pollutants we're looking at across that. And so trying to aggregate that together on in my head right now would be difficult. And I don't want to provide an incorrect number. We can look at the, at the air we read the report and, and point you to the particular pages in that report to provide that number. Okay. Uh, additional questions? Mr. Kilosh, do you have additional um, comments you'd like to make? You didn't really get to testify here yet. Madam Chair. Oh, Senator Sanjo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just, I'm just trying to understand 
this bill and, and, and the motives a little bit. And I have no problems with clean car. For those that, that want electric cars, that's fine. I hope I live long enough to get one myself. But uh, the 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 whole idea of uh, of how does how the agency believes you solve at least in part some of this problem by by imposing on auto dealers the responsibility to buy and to sell those. That is what I'm not understanding. You know that that that's not the role of government. I mean, the role of government, I I believe at least, is to, is to let the market. We would not do that with any other product I can think of. Why are we doing with cars? And what what moves the agency to think this is, if you will, the proper role of government? And I say this understanding that, uh, you know, I, I think electric vehicles are are fine and uh, and they'll get they'll get better. More than likely, many of us will have them, but. But at this point in time in history, why are we just demanding that car dealers have to inventory them at that at, at, at car dealership costs, the personal cost to that car, the owner of that car dealership? I, I don't understand that motivation at all. And just just help me a little bit with that. Maybe I can understand this initiative a little bit better. Mr. McDonald, yes. like that? Madam Chair and Senator Senjim, um, the clean cars proposal is predicated on a three-pronged approach, right? Reducing air emissions um, for the criteria of pollutants that Mr. Colas addressed, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as well as providing consumer choice. The clean cars proposal and the ZEV standard does provide that consumer choice. As we heard as we've traveled across the state, and as you'll probably hear from other testifiers, consumers do not have access to the cars that they would like to have, um, and we can ensure that they have those access. In addition, the ZEV program has um, a credit compliance system that is a market-based solution to allow the regulated parties, which are automobile manufacturers, to trade credits to ensure that they're in compliance. Senator Senjim. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Uh, just take me a little bit further. So the reason a car dealer cannot get cars in Minnesota is because of, of, of some governmental regulation, or is it within the whole manufacturing and auto distribution system? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Sinjim, I think that question specifically, um, you'd have to talk to dealers and manufacturers in that relationship, which we've heard can be somewhat tenuous, or full of tension. But I think that we've heard from people that you cannot get these cars unless you are a ZEV state. Our own commissioner testified last time that she went to three different automobile dealerships seeking a certain vehicle, and she was unable to get that vehicle. So consumers are demanding this, and we want to ensure that Minnesotans have the ability to get the vehicles that they want. It doesn't require anybody to purchase an electric vehicle, um, and that we're on the leading edge. We know car manufacturers are continuing to invest in electric vehicles on the order of $200 billion. More and more models will be coming, and this rule will ensure that those models come to Minnesota. Senator Sendum. Uh, thank you, uh, continually. Uh, so if, so I think what I'm hearing is that, uh, is that the state of Minnesota is going to tell the auto manufacturers and distributors uh, that they need to send cars to Minnesota, even though perhaps the sales market isn't there, at least at this point in time, uh, and that just seems counterintuitive to you know, the, the marketplace as I know it, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> thank you. Other questions? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, it's interesting when the Deputy Commissioners give an answer, and then the response is exactly 180 degrees the opposite. We'll hear from uh, additional testifiers who will, who will make this point, um, and the point that's already been made, and that is that um, people are seeking these models and not finding them in Minnesota and having to go other places to buy them. There is a huge demand for um, about half of the available fuel efficient and, uh, and electric vehicle models. Um, that simply aren't available here in Minnesota. In those other states that have the standard, they are available. The manufacturers tell us straight up, these are the only places where they're going to be selling these uh, for the time being because these standards uh, signal a market readiness. What follows from market readiness is the kind of infrastructure that gets built by the private sector in terms of charging infrastructure and the like um, so that people can A, uh, the bottles are brought here so they can buy them, and B, um, they can then find the, the necessary charging infrastructure so they feel comfortable driving them. So the market will follow and respond as it always does 
on the basis and foundation and framework of the policies that are set in this state. That's the way the markets always work. That's the way they always have. That's the, the way they work on numerous items of policy that, that we set forth. Talk, look at liquor. Look at the liquor industry. How many regulations do we have around that? It seems to function pretty well. Um, and uh, we don't talk about free market. If we did talk about free market, we'd get rid of the three-tier system, and that seems to be sacrosanct. There's a lot of things we regulate pretty heavily, and the market follows and corresponds according to the standards we set forth. Senator Dole, was there a question there? Or? All right. Thank Madam you. Uh, Senator St. John. What I'm not getting is that probably on this thing right here, I can just about buy anything I want, including maybe a car right now. And, and what precludes, nothing precludes me from doing it. Uh, but we're, we're about ready, at least through the agency, to enact a rule that's going to require manufacturers to send cars into Minnesota, require auto dealers to own them or at least uh, I'm not sure what that financial relationship is, but when you see all these cars on a, on a, on a car lot, you know that the, that, that local owner is paying something to, to, to keep them there, and that's expensive if they're not selling. And, and I'm just, I struggle with why, why would we do that? Why would we interject ourselves into that, into that process that is owned by the auto manufacturers and distributors and dealers? Why are we going there as a government? Senator Dibble. Madam Chair, uh, what Senator Sengem is advocating is that we send Minnesotans into to other states to get cars, and not every Minnesotan has that ability. Why do we want to lose those sales to other states anyways? So, you know. Madam Chair, I'm not advocating, but, but it, 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 if, if, if I can't buy the right kind of furniture in Minnesota uh, because I don't have a particular store like this in Rochester, I, I have options, and we have options to buy almost anything we want. Uh, electronically nowadays, and, uh, and and that works. And a lot of people do it. We know that. Uh, uh, E-commerce is, is taking over our world, literally, and it can take it over in automobiles as well. Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you, you, Senator Lang brought up a good question about where will you, where will you stop in your rulemaking process? And, and I think the rulemaking process today, I think we can all agree that um, should be driving to implement legislation and at the will of the legislature. And you implied today it's only the clean cars, but it doesn't appear that you're following the will of the legislature because first off, you're not even intending to seek the will of the legislature. So what assurances would you give us that you're not going to move into commercial um, vehicles, buses, and, uh, and, and any other vehicles that you choose um, without without um, the legislature input or very few um, citizen opportunities to, to play a role in this process. This is a really impactful process. And so what assurances are you gonna provide us that um, this, this process is not gonna move into every single vehicle that you deem um, appropriate in spite of what the legislature decides? Mr. Madam McDonald. Chair and Senator Corrin. Um, uh, to the second part of your question, um, our process has been transparent and open. We've had those six public meetings. We've solicited input. We've had an online survey. We'll be holding public information sessions as part of this um, this spring, additional ones where we'll be traveling the state. So folks are having the opportunity to provide us their input. We seek that. We welcome it. Um, and we will go all across the state. To the other part of your question, you know, we are focused in on the Clean Cars Minnesota um, proposal. The proposal will be out there. Our intent is to focus on those LEV and ZEV standards and to move that forward. And as our past precedent has shown, we have used rulemaking authorities, um, the specific authority addressed under this bill, very, very judiciously. And that is the intent that we have here, was to use it to achieve a need that we've identified. Madam Chair, Senator so Grant. the answer is no, you don't intend to provide us any insurances, assurances that it stops at cars, it'll move on to whatever you deem appropriate without the legislature. Um, I, don't, I don't think um, changes like this should be considered without a thorough vetting. How many, um, the open and transparent process works in, in your world, it doesn't work for the average citizen. And so when you talk about as a thousand people you spoke to, how many cars are in the state of Minnesota today? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Curran, I believe it's roughly 5 million registered vehicles. Okay, so Senator Curran. 
um, not even a statistically valid sample of a thousand people who could possibly find and track um, the notifications of where they may or may not show up. And so um, we find in this process that those um, who are following this heavily that that want to move this forward are probably the likely ones to, to track it. The average Minnesotan has no ability and no interest to even understand where this process is and how to participate. I'm not sure that you care. Um, I'm saying the legislature should define these roles that are significantly impactful when we're deciding who and what and what products you should buy and where, where they are. And uh, so I certainly support Senator Matthews' role. Um, the rulemaking process not designed for you to write, legis write law. This is extremely impactful to, to all citizens in Minnesota. Um, I'd also like you to, to uh, as you move forward, and, and I, I would suspect there's a commercial element to this, ask how the Metro Transit electric bus foray or, uh, or fiasco is going. We'd like you guys to bring those things forward. We have infrastructure needs. Um, you admitted that the uh, air quality has re been, re been improved. Economy, fuel economy is moving. I think it appears to work exactly as we had hoped. We all want efficient, clean cars and, uh, and clean air. Um, I think there's a gross overreach by the agency and, and certainly is, is, a, uh, is a shot at the legislature that we are no longer necessary. And I think that's uh, atrocious for this body. Thank you. Senator Swadinsky, do you still have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around this and it's really interesting to me. So um, how many states have adopted the California standard? Mr. Madam Mayor. Chair and Senator Swadzinski, there are two parts of the standard, the LEV standard and the ZEV standard. 14 states in California have adopted the LEV standard, the low emission vehicle standard. 11 states and the District of Columbia have adopted the ZEV standard. Senator Swadinsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. So is it safe to say that those states have given incentives to the car manufacturers to sell their products in those states? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Swinsinski, some of these um, states have provided incentives and, and um, other programs to um, incentivize or to make sure that we are taking an all of the above approach. And here in Minnesota, we're doing the same thing with the VW settlement. We are dedicating a portion of that, the maximum allowable amount, which is 15% towards EV charging infrastructure and considering um, other ways, such as a bonding proposal for additional EV charging infrastructure as well to make sure that that system is built out. What, what, Senator Swinsinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's safe to say, though, that the states that have given some sort of incentive are having all the electric vehicles that customers are saying they want in Minnesota, but they can't find them because they're, the manufacturers are not finding the incentives in the other states. Is that a safe statement for me to tell my constituents? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Swidzinski, I think it would be that these standards are successful where there's an all above, above the approach um, that includes EV and charging infrastructure, and that's where we're focusing on to make sure that that's available, as well as the manufacturers bringing those vehicles for sale in the state. So um, it is an all above the approach, and that's what we're pursuing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, and Senator Swidinski, I think it's uh, important to note that uh, in the count of the states that have um, adopted these standards, um, as we heard in the last hearing, there is no state in the Midwest that has heard, or that have adopted the standards, and none of our neighbors. So we would be an island unto ourselves if we adopted these standards, as we heard in our committee. So, uh, Senator Cran, you had another question. Yeah, I just want to follow up with a comment. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the all of the above uh, approach sounds wonderful, except it eliminates the choice, and that's just not what we're about in this state. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so you said it's in all of the above. What incentives are we providing for buyers currently? Madam Chair and Senator Howe, um, our colleagues at the Minnesota Department of Transportation are continuing to work on that, but one of the incentives that they're providing is a MinPass incentive for folks who purchase um, a new electric vehicle. Senator Howe. So that's great for those folks that tran transit here in the Twin Cities where you have multiple options for transit already, you're gonna offer, if you buy an electric vehicle, you can use the MinPass lane, uh, but that is after they purchase it. What are we in doing to help the auto dealers sell these vehicles and get them into the hands of the public? Uh, Mr. McDonald, and I will remind um, 
this group that, that we are not hearing the Clean Cars Act today. We are hearing Senator Matthews' bill, and if we could kind of swing back to the topic of the conversation, I, it would be appreciated. So, Mr. McDonald. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Howe, um, at the MPCA, we're providing the funds, as I said, for EV charging infrastructure to make sure people can travel all across Minnesota. We also have dedicated outreach and engagement um, so folks know um, the basics of EVs as well as um, you know, how they can charge up and the benefits of them. So there's an education and outreach and infrastructure buildup. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're not really providing any financial incentives. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you. Um, just one quick point before I ask my question. Um, it's important to also, as we talk about the states that have adopted the LEV and the ZEV standards, uh, to remember that um, this was actually the direction that the entire country was going under the previous administration's EPA uh, until the current uh, president decided to uh, reverse course uh, and, and eliminate that uh, adoption nationwide. And so the manufacturers and the market was, uh, uh, had accepted and was, was preparing, for that, preparing for that future. And then, of course, uh, the oil industry um, helped elect a new president and, uh, and reversed course immediately. The question I have to the, to the uh, test fires to give us an indication of the level of, of interest on the part of private and, and public interests in, in adopting newer low, in, low emission uh, and clean auto and vehicle technology. Um, there's some indication, I think, in the VW settlement funds and how those are being used and, and um, how well subscribed or what level of demand there is for, for those. That gives us some indication uh, of what folks are, are trying to achieve with the limited resources we do have. Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, you're absolutely right. Um, most of our VW grants in the first phase were oversubscribed. Um, so folks, there was more demand out there than we could fill um, for that across those grants, especially for EV charging infrastructure. Other questions? Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I have a question, but I want to I want to address some things that I've been hearing since then that um, we talk about uh, ceding our authority to California. That seems to be an ongoing phrase here. And I guess I, I just want to say I've been traveling to California for more than 30 years. Actually, it's almost 40 years now since I worked in a company that had several locations out there. And I've seen what they have done to their air. They, in 1981, they had layers of smog. And they started addressing this. And the federal government did not, California did. And now, when I go out there, and I was out there two months ago, uh, there is no layers. There is very little smog. It has to be a very special day before there's even a warning that you would get on your telephone about air quality. This is what they have done. They are leading in this whole idea. So the, uh, the California envy, I just don't understand that. And on a, I'm going to have a question here that will relate to that. But um, when we talk about the government telling us what to, what to buy or dealerships what to sell, I don't, I don't understand even making that statement. You know, the brake lights, the tail lights, the odometers, the emission standards, the headlights, license plate lights, uh, DOT approved seat belts, DOT approved windows, all of those things. You can't buy a car here that doesn't comply with those standards. And some of those have been instituted by states first, and then the feds adopted them. The feds have been very slow in adopting some of these standards, and in right now, like uh, Senator Dibble says, we've backed up, we've gone backwards. So I think that there's, there's, a, and there's one thing here that we're refusing to admit, and that is that climate change is coming, and this is about climate change. And we have to say that it either is real or we're going to be denying it. I don't want to deny it. My grandson lives in California. He's two years old. And I'm very happy that they made the changes out there. And I would like to make the changes here for any child that's growing up in Minnesota. We don't need to have those kinds of problems in Minnesota, and especially in our inner cities where the pollutants are far higher than they are in any other area. And everybody does visit the cities, and some people even move here too. So I don't have a problem at all with trying to make our air cleaner and trying to do it 
even to some degree like we do with, uh, by the way, diesel trucks, we mandate the exhausts on them. We mandate that on buses. We mandate that on a lot of our vehicles to clean up the air. And I think this is just another step for getting that done. And what I want to ask Mr. Mr. McDonald is, uh, in, with these states, and I don't know if you you said that LEVs are 14, ZEVs are 11. Are those do those overlap? And I guess I'd like to know is what is the the portion of total sales that are going to those states, um, and what other states are actually con, um, considering adapting the ZEV and LEV? Because not having them in the states that surround us is only temporary. They will, they will adopt it eventually, or maybe we'll even have a federal adoption. Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and uh, Senator Carlson, uh, the states, there is overlap between states that are 11s of. The 11 that are of are also LEV states, um, so there are there. There are states that are cold weather states, similar to Minnesota. They've had no issues complying with that. Um, for, as far as other states looking into adopting it, um, New Mexico is looking at adopting the uh, clean car standards, and we've heard that um, through the rumor mill that other states are considering it as well, um, but nothing firm on that. Nobody has come out. Senator Carlson. And, and the percentage of new vehicles sold in those states? Mr. McDonald. Madam, Madam Chair and Senator Carlson, that is something that we'll have to get back to you on, the total percentage of vehicles. That's just not at my fingertips right now. Okay, thank you. Carlson. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen, unless Mr. Kolesh, you have something you'd like to add. No, no. All right, thank you. Uh, next up we have uh, Margaret Hendrick and Joe Ward. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record. Who would like to go first? Um, do you want to go first? Uh, Madam Chair, members, my name is Margaret Cherney Hendrick. I am testifying today on behalf of Fresh Energy. Uh, Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with over 25 years of experience developing practical clean energy policy that benefits all Minnesotans. Fresh Energy supports the Clean Cars Minnesota proposal. Our analysis is clear. Clean Cars Minnesota offers cost savings to all Minnesotans on top of real health and climate benefits, as others will discuss today. Unfortunately, Senate File 3496, as amended, attempts to block the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency from delivering these benefits to Minnesotans. Fresh Energy believes this is the wrong approach and opposes this legislation. Bringing more electric vehicles to Minnesota will save both owners and non-owners money on their electric bills. It works like this. Electricity from Minnesota's grid is cheapest overnight when there's little demand and renewable wind power is abundant. With the right utility program, most electric vehicle owners will charge overnight at home, reaping the benefits of cheaper, cleaner energy. Most electric vehicles are already charged this way. This also means that the utility increases its sale of electricity without needing expensive grid updates to meet the extra demand. Fixed costs over higher sales of electricity means all kilowatt hours sold become cheaper regardless of whether you own an electric vehicle or not. Data from other states confirms this, and a 2018 MJ Bradley report on Minnesota found that in a high electric vehicle adoption scenario with overnight charging, utility customers could save $170 on their bills annually by 2050. This scenario applies to both investor-owned utilities as well as rural electric co-ops and municipal utilities. Excel already has an electric vehicle home charging program to encourage overnight charging, as does Dakota Electric. Otter Tail Power, which covers Bemidji, Fergus Falls, and Morris, will be filing their own electric vehicle home charging program this summer. These programs ensure that electric vehicle owners, ratepayers, and utilities all benefit from more electric vehicles. Finally, we'd like to clarify some points of confusion from previous discussions of this issue. $800 has been repeated as the expected cost to impact new internal combustion passenger vehicles under the Clean Cars Minnesota regulations but this figure by itself is misleading. The $800 cost estimate comes from regulatory analysis conducted by the Colorado's Department of Public Health and the Environment during their clean cars proceeding. 
That same analysis goes on to show that costs would be paid back in under five years from savings on fuel with net savings over $1,600 over the lifetime of that car. The analysis also shows that for those who finance their vehicle purchase, saving begins immedi immediately. Given that 86% of Americans finance or lease a new vehicle, this means consumers will save money from day one on fuel efficient internal combustion vehicles. Clean Cars Minnesota saves money for our consumers, blocking the pollution agency's ability to protect Minnesotans from harmful vehicle emissions won't just harm metro dwellers, it will harm all Minnesotans. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. My name is Joe Ward. I'm I'm a PhD electrical engineer. I'm a retired 3M person. I recently, I'm a business person. I recently sold my high-tech inkjet colorant business uh, to a large chemical company. Uh, I serve on the Woodbury Economic Development Advisory Commission, though I'm not speaking for them today. I'm a policy board member of Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light and a long-term electric vehicle owner. I do feel that the proposal in SF 3496 is, is not the right direction. Um, and I want to just editorialize a little bit. I've been listening to all of this discussion. I find it very interesting, uh, very good to hear the various points of views presented. And I believe in problem solving. I believe that from a business point of view, we all can sit down at the table, work together, and find better ways than than our corners that we often get pushed into. So uh, I, I prefer to take a forward-looking rather than a backward-looking view at a business. I, I think an astute business, one, business person is one who looks at innovations and looks at changes that are coming in our economy and in technology and tries to leverage those and take advantage of those and ride that curve. And that's the kind of thing I had the f good fortune to experience at 3M and in my own business. Changing technology created opportunities from a business point of view that we were able to exploit. I think in the case of electric vehicles, um, the market has not responded. Uh, I began looking for an electric vehicle when the Volt was announced back, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, whatever it was. And I went to my local Chevrolet dealer, and they were not interested. Uh, they explained that they made their money on large pickup trucks. That's where their profit margins were. That's uh, people wanted performance, and they didn't want to be in a uh, tin can. Uh, they wanted a vehicle that was comfortable, large, and, and would get them what they want and would be at a reasonable price. Um, of course, electric vehicles are offering all of those things now. Um, but the market has not responded. Uh, as we look at the legislation and the opportunity for the legislators to, to do these things, there's a lot of people saying, yes, we should pay attention to climate change. We need to make some changes, changes, changes. But we always seem to leave it off when it gets time to get to the omnibus bill. Uh, it just doesn't happen in the end. And so I've, I'm frustrated with that, and I, I just like to see climate and related things be at a level that, that is a priority. And I see in this discussion that happening. So um, I guess in the end, too, I, I Talking about California back in the in the 1950s when I was a kid, um, we lived there for the summer. We experienced that pollution. It's gone now. California has been a leader, and look what the result that they've gotten. And uh, I guess I'd point to from a business point of view that uh, a, a little company called Tesla that nobody thought would succeed, that as of yesterday had a stock price of $800 a share, up from 200 earlier this year, is uh, a pretty good example of what happens when somebody rides a new technology. At first, nobody believes it, but then as it catches on, that that curve goes up, you really have a business opportunity. So um, California is succeeding. I, 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 I'd vote for, for following and trying to, to look at those models. I think clean cars do mean cleaner air. 
and just look at it from an input-output point of view. I mean, the uh, life and breath, how air pollution affects public health in Minnesota study in 2019 by the Minnesota Department of Health found that over 2,000 premature deaths are attributable to Minnesota air pollution. You, you know those figures, I know those, and we can argue about the numbers and where they come from all day long, but from an input-output point of view, uh, we know that an EV produces a lot less pollutants than an internal combustion engine. So that's got to be a positive. We're moving forward. We also, of course, understand that low income and communities of color in urban areas or on the, on, on the, uh, on the reservation uh, inequitably experience the, the, the problems that we've come up with. So I believe, uh, frankly, that cleaning up emissions from transportation, uh, and again, how you cut the percentages, whether it's 24% of the whole thing or whether it's part of, uh, whether you include it over the road trucks and that or buses or, or tractors or something, is not the point. The point is every, we need all of the above. We need every step we can take. I, I was interested to read just in the news the other day that people didn't understand the benefits of fuel costs. Um, Excuse the, me, uh, Mr. Ward, could you uh, wrap up? We have uh, many other testifiers here today. I, I so shall. Thank you. I shall. The, uh, I just did a comparison based on my own data of the cost of fuel for my EV that I've owned for five years. I've driven it 73,000 miles. I pay the equivalent of 42 cents per gallon of gas. I looked up the costs for Virginia, Minnesota as well. And if you do the same calculations in Virginia, Minnesota, you pay 47 cents a gallon for gas. Gas is higher uh, up there, electricity is a little higher. Uh, you take that by 15,000 miles per year driven in a 30 mile per gallon car and it adds up, if you do 15000 a year, you save $960 a year on fuel. Just That's based on my data, my personal experience. And here in St. Paul, it's $934 a year. That's over 10000 in a lifetime of a car, which more than pays the additional purchase price. So I, I will wrap up by saying, uh, yes, EVs do improve public health, combat climate change, purchase prices are dropping. But from a overall input-output business point of view, uh, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for public health, for our pocketbooks, and for our climate. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Thank you. Uh, next we have Kathleen Schuler and Carolyn Berenger. Welcome, ladies. Who would like to go first? Madam Chair, Senators, my name is Kathleen Schuler, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Health Professionals for Healthy Climate. We're a multidisciplinary network of over 500 Minnesota nurses, doctors, public health experts, and allied health professionals across the state of Minnesota. We have members in St. Cloud, in Rochester, and we have a chapter in Duluth. We support clean car standards, including standards to achieve zero vehicle emissions in Minnesota, to reduce and eventually eliminate climate change causing pollution from vehicles that contributes to adverse health impacts from air pollution and climate change. We oppose SF3496, which would repeal the authority of the MPCA to address vehicle emissions and their contribution to air pollution. The bill costs, calls for a costly and unnecessary study of the potential impacts of California's zero emission standards. Rather than a study, we can begin reaping the benefits of cleaner air and healthier climate through continuing on the path to adopting clean car standards. I'm a public health professional. Public health is essentially about preventing harm to human health through population-based strategies, including reducing environmental contaminants. Air pollution is an area where we have strong science showing adverse impacts on human health, including heart disease, cancer, hypertension, asthma, decrease in lung function, stroke, kidney disease, and reduced birth weight for the offspring of women exposed to air pollution during pregnancy. 
in the life and breath report that's been referred to, um, it's pointed out that we could save 2,000 to 4,000 lives a year, uh, save 500 additional hospital stays and 800 emergency room visits by reducing air, air pollution. Clean car standards will save lives and improve health, especially in neighborhoods with higher percentage of lower income people, people of color, and indigenous people that already experience high levels of air pollution. Improvement in air quality translates into better health with increased life expectancies. Studies show that children's lung function improves and they have fewer bronchitis episodes when there's improvement in air quality. And by the way, that information comes from studies of children in California. Uh, Senator Carlson referred to the air quality improvements and we have epidemiological studies showing that it does improve children's health. On a personal note, I live less than a block from I-94 and reduced auto emissions from this stretch of highway could improve air quality for the children, seniors, and people with chronic illnesses that live in my neighborhood. But air pollution is not just a problem in urban neighborhoods. The Department of Health and the PCA study also show that the death rate attributable to air pollution was actually higher in rural areas than in cities and was particularly bad in southern Minnesota and along the state's border with South Dakota. Transportation is the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in our state. Clean Cars Minnesota is an important strategy to reduce carbon emissions and help clean up our air. Uh, for this reason, I oppose the bill and I believe that we should allow the Pollution Control Agency to continue pursuing clean car standards. Thank you. Thank you. Members, other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rood and members of the committee. My name is Carolyn Berninger, and I am a Climate and Energy Policy Analyst at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, or MCEA. MCEA is a nonprofit organization with almost 50 years of experience using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment and the health of its people. We strongly support maintaining the PCA's authority to enact the Clean Cars Standard as a way to reduce our state's contribution to climate change, to save money for Minnesota households, and to improve public health. As you've heard today, for many reasons, Clean Cars Minnesota is a good choice for our state. First, improving vehicle efficiency will save Minnesotans money over the lifetime of their vehicles. And even more importantly, the Clean Cars Rule will decrease costs across the state by reducing harmful air pollution and improving public health. We've heard today we don't have the specific numbers for Minnesota yet, but the regulatory analysis in Colorado, which sees about the same annual vehicle, st vehicle sales as Minnesota, calculated that the standard would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30 million tons over the first 10 years of the program in that state. In 2017, our Public Utilities Commission in Minnesota adopted values that estimate the economic costs of um, greenhouse gas emissions. And based on those values, avoiding 30 million tons of CO2 emissions means avoiding between 270 million to $1.3 billion in damages to agriculture, public health, and other aspects of the economy. Finally, it's also been estimated that the LEV and ZEV standards together would provide up to $100 million in public health benefits to Colorado by, per year by 2050 by reducing levels of particulate matter in the air. And this would mean an immediate decrease in instances of asthma and heart disease, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and early deaths. We support the clean cars rule because it will reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and harmful air pollution around the state. It will save customers money at the pump and it will improve access to clean vehicles for the Minnesotans that want them. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Thank you. And next up we have Kevin Lee and Jean Comstock. Welcome to the committee. Who would like to go first? You can. Sure. Just follow the list. <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair, uh, I, I will be brief. My name is Kevin Lee. I'm the State Policy Director at the Blue Green Alliance. We are an organization that unites America's largest labor unions and environmental organizations, uh, together representing millions of Americans. I'm here today to talk about how this bill would affect investments in manufacturing jobs right here in Minnesota. Um, I think one thing that is not very well understood is that when the federal standards were passed in, uh, were issued rather in 2012, uh, manufacturers in the U.S. 
really rose to the challenge of building the next generation of advanced vehicles. And we've really established ourselves here in America as, as a global leader. Uh, that leadership is a lot easier to lose than it is to gain. And right now the federal government is rolling those standards backwards. Uh, and if we do nothing, it will take us with them. Uh, so the issue is, is not, you know, California standards, Minnesota standards. It's just about whether we're moving forward or backward. Um, this rollback has impacts in Minnesota. In our state, there are 16 manufacturers and assemblers uh, that produce components that improve fuel economy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These companies employ 3,000 Minnesotans. They manufacture everything from hybrid electric drive system components, uh, propulsion systems for battery electric vehicles, and thermal management systems uh, for those batteries. And our analysis shows that when you flatline the standards in 2020, uh, which is what happened, would happen under the federal uh, action being undertaken right now, this significantly slows adoption of these advanced technologies in almost every vehicle subsystem. Uh, and cuts demand for the products made by these manufacturers right here in Minnesota. Uh, many of these companies have already invested in research and development, uh, in plant equipment, in new staff, and rolling back these standards strands those investments. So to protect those jobs in, in Minnesota, we urge uh, that this bill be opposed. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Thank you, and Ms. Comstock, welcome to Hi. the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I understand your, your uh, admonition to stick to the, the bill we're talking about as opposed to the clean air or the clean cars ruling, but we seem to be coming back to that all the time. So I'm trying to pull it out of my testimony and going on the fly here. So I hope you give me a little leeway. Um, I do want to talk to you about the, the regular average Minnesotan that we were talking about. I think I'm one of those people. And I want to tell you about last June, I spent some major time looking for an electric vehicle that would fit my requirements for range and price. I got out the big spreadsheet from the National EV Association and went through and marked them up. And I missed the part about some of these are not available in all states. And of course, I had my list. I went into the Twin Cities dealerships. And when I told them what I was after, the salespeople would kind of chuckle and say, oh, we don't have that here. Um, and no, no hint about what else I could do. So I ended up not getting a car at all. And I don't think that I'm unusual in that. I think there may be a lot more people out there doing that than we know about, but they're met with this resistance and therefore they, they can't go any further. But I think they're just waiting for these cars to get here. Um, I will say, trying to go back to the thing we're actually talking about, I'm in opposition to this bill taking back the authority from the PCA. I think Clean Cars Minnesota is a good plan and the MPCA should be allowed to proceed as soon as possible because the climate crisis is real. I believe it's here right now and I think we need to start working on it faster than we are. If I can step out of my role with the uh, uh, Minnesota 350 and St. Paul 350, I'd like to say that as Gene Q. Public sitting here, it really sounds like there's a lot of opposition to trying to get cleaner energy into Minnesota. I grew up in North Dakota, but I don't live there. I don't live in South Dakota or Iowa or Wisconsin because I wanted to come to Minnesota. They're the leader in so many things and we want to continue to have them lead. Please, I'm asking you not to kick the can any further down the road by delaying this action by the MPCA. Therefore, I would like to state as a representative of Minnesota 350 and St. Paul 350 that we stand firmly with the MPCA and support their intent with the Clean Cars Minnesota rule. I ask you respectfully to please oppose this bill blocking their actions and keeping us behind. Now is the time to let us move forward, please. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Thank you. Is there anyone else that wanted to testify on this bill? With that, Senator Matthews. Oh, Senator Sendum. Madam Chair, may I just have one question for the Pollution Control Agency? Okay. Um, Mr. McDonald, would you come back up? Uh, 
Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to go back to the to the bill and to the authority that the bill, pardon me, that the uh, existing statutes give you uh, to, uh, I'm not sure to go the direction you're going, but the, the, at least the authority that the statutes give you. So it says the agency uh, shall uh, also adopt standards of air quality, including maximum allowable standards of emission of air contaminants for, from motor vehicles. And then it goes on to say, recognizing there may be variabilities around the state where the purity doesn't uh, can vary and you don't need to go to that far. So if you were to come here and tell me that uh, you're going to impose zero emission standards on all cars in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, Duluth, St. Cloud perhaps, I may, I don't know if I'd like that or not, but I would say that this, the law gives you authority to do that. What I don't understand in this, because that's the standard, that's a zero standard. No emissions from tailpipes, no cities. I think, I think what you got here would allow you to do that. What I don't understand, how those same words allow you to impose standards on whether car dealerships have certain kind of vehicles or not. That's what I don't understand about all this. And uh, can you help me with that? How, how do you get from those words here to the kind of rule that you're kind of trying to impose? Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair and Senator Sinjim, the authorities under 116.07, which we're discussing, do allow us to set a standard that regulated parties need to meet. And in this case, the regulated party is a manufacturer. But similar to other regulation, the PCA can set a standard, and that standard is for compliance. Um, and the upon a regulated party, similar to any type of a permit that we issue that requires somebody to meet a standard. Madam Chair, just to follow Senator up, Senator. I'm still not understanding. If, if you came, again, if you came here and say, we're going to impose this standard, it's going to be zero. You know, that's what an EV is. That's zero. But, but you're not saying that. You're saying we're going to impose some sort of a process that's going to affect the, uh, you know, the, the, the automobile industry, and we're going to require them to do that. That's not a zero standard. That's, that's something other than a zero emission standard. That, that's, that is different, and that's what I'm not understanding. And maybe, Ms. Madam Chair, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Senator Sender, and thank you. Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, I am grateful for the robust discussion that we've had with this bill. Uh, I understand that there's very strong opinions on this, um, but uh, just with a couple closing comments, I think a couple of the senators uh, wisely pointed out, I think this sets a very bad precedence, and I was amazed that the agency would not commit to not going further in the future. Uh, and. Uh, use agency speak to say we're staying focused on clean cars now, but what is it going to be in the future? Clean semis, clean tractors. I think this uh, cracks the door open uh, for uh, harmful proposals down the road and a future administration could come back and utilize the same tools and try to go 100 miles in the opposite direction. And I don't think we should do that. I think this needs to remain in the legislature where we are all accountable to our citizens and to our districts. Um, and I uh, was amazed that they, that the agency came and tried to say with a straight face how this is taking away Minnesota's right to set Minnesota standards, uh, when it in fact is doing the opposite. Uh, the proposed rules will take it out of our hands to set the standards how they need to be for our districts, for our communities, for our state. And uh, that's why uh, we have this bill. So. With that, Madam Chair, if there's no other discussion, I would... Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I had an amendment. Uh, Senator Eaton. I have the A3 amendment. The A3? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> While that's being passed out, members, would you like to explain, Senator? Sure. Um, it's really short. It just says that... Um, on page one, line 23, after the period, insert scientific knowledge of the existence and causes of climate change shall be considered when adopting air quality standards. And I think that um, it's important that um, the, base, the basic focus is on scientific knowledge, and that's what we use uh, to make these decisions under climate for climate change. 
Senator Matthews, do you have the amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, it was just handed to me here. Would you like to comment or do you have questions? Uh, Madam Chair, it appears to be duplicative to what's already stated there in statute and uh, the consideration of climate change seems to be what a lot of the agencies do already, what a lot of the companies are focused on already. So uh, I don't see the need for it at this time. Um, I'm just handed it and this is the first time seeing of it, but that's my initial reaction to it. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to request a roll call vote on this amendment. Roll call has been requested, roll call granted. Are there other questions on the amendment? No other questions? We'll take the roll. Senator Ruth? No. Senator Sw Swadinski? Yes. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Coran? No. Senator Weber? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator Howe? No. Senator Sengem? No. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Eaton? Yes. Senator Torres Ray? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. There being five in favor and seven opposed, the motion does not carry. Senator Matthews, any final comments? Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, would like to thank the different organizations that came to testify uh, before the Environment Committee. We need to hear your voices. Um, clearly, I am also interested in hearing from the auto industry, but I don't serve in, in those committees, so my assumption is that you will have ample opportunities to talk about the impact of this proposal on the auto industry. And uh, Senator, I have a question um, related to your study. So uh, I actually have two questions. One is the proposal for a million dollar investment that goes into um, anticipated economic impact. And it says, uh, you know, of course, about motor vehicles because that's what this bill is about. So that particular funding, is it being proposed here because that million dollars will come out of an environmental account? What, where does this money come from? I, I just want to understand that. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Torres Ray. Uh, right now, as written, it is uh, straight from the general fund. Uh, does not appear to come from a specific fund uh, designated. Uh, I do think this part will likely get worked over. I don't know if uh, I'll want it left that way or not after I take feedback from testimony that's been given here today. But uh, as it stands right now, it's a straight general fund appropriation. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, since we are in the Environment Committee, and I think this testimony has been very clear that uh, what we want to do is really address our greenhouse emission, emissions in Minnesota and how we need to make progress on that. I would like to offer an oral amendment just to change one word in that study so that it's clear, I, I believe, as to what is the intent here. Uh, so on, in line 4.8, I would like to change the word economic impact and just put environmental impact. And I would like to see if the uh, um, testifiers have any uh, opinion on that. Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, thank you for uh, the oral amendment. I will not support it if it's removing the word economic, because I think that is a vital uh, area that this needs to encompass. 
Um, I may be amenable to adding so that the two of them stay together. Uh, I'll leave that uh, up for the committee there. I'd like council to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what this oral amendment would say. Uh, but if it's replacing the word economic with the word environmental, I would encourage a no vote. Mr. Knopf, could you read it with the two words included? Is that what you'd like to hear? Um, Madam Chair, the way Senator Matthews is talking, this is different from the amendment that's been offered. Um, it would, um, after anticipated, you insert the words environmental and, so it would be anticipated, anticipated environmental and economic impact um, in the state from adopting the California emission standards. Senator Ray. Thank you. If that's okay with the author, I would like to move forward with that. Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, um, yes, I'll accept that oral amendment. All right. Senator Ray, is that amendable to you? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator Swedinsky. I'd like to introduce an amendment, the two. Oh. Senator Swedinsky, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, members, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Senator Swedinsky. Thank you, Madam Chair, again. I'd like to introduce the A2 amendment. Um, As the A2 amendment is being passed out, Senator Swedinsky, would you like to uh, explain what your yeah, amendment th does? Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment basically restores the original um, bill and the original intent. Uh, we've heard a lot today about uh, violation of separation of powers, and I see the this bill actually violating separation of powers. I think the original intent of the two branches of government was that the citizen legislature uh, of, made up of teachers and business people and accountants and lawyers and doctors and such would pass the laws and the various agencies of the executive branch would interpret those laws to follow the intent of the citizen legislature. And so I see this bill um, somewhat violating that original charge of the uh, legislative branch. And so I just wanted to make everybody aware of that. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you. Um, just kind of uh, uh, following on from Senator Swadzinski's argument uh, in favor um, of his amendment, um, uh, Senator Matthews um, made the point at the outset of his presentation of his proposal that um, there was an unconstitutional violation of the separation of powers and that the PCA was um, stepping outside of its uh, scope of responsibility, yet offers this bill which um, deletes their ability to um, adopt standards of air quality, including maximum allowable standards. Uh, actually, um, it, it specifies specifically not including maximum allowable standards of emission of air contaminants from motor vehicles under his A1 amendment, which I think is a recognition that, in fact, the PCA has that authority. And the legislature has the ability to amend that authority, so the legislature's uh, prerogatives are not violated. And, of course, the PCA reminded us that even under the adoption of rules that uh, the legislature can stop their authority to write rules, can amend rules, can um, repeal rules at, at any time. So I'd request a roll call vote on three, on the Swadzinski A2 amendment. Roll call has been requested. Roll call will be granted. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. This appears to be a simple delete all amendment, the way I'm reading it. And so I would ask for a no vote on the amendment. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble. Just to be clear, delete section one. Thank you, Senator Dibble. The Secretary will take the roll. Senator Rood? No. Senator Swadinski? Yes. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Cran? No. Senator Weber? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator Howe? No. Senator Sedgham? No. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Eaton? Yes. Senator Torres Ray? Yes. Senator Carlson? Yes. There being five nays and seven ayes, the motion 
Did, oh, sorry. <laughs> you like that, did you? <laughs> there being. <laughs> there being five eyes and seven nays, the motion does not carry. It's I'm a long, sure. long day, Senator. Uh, there, Senator Dibble. I'm sure I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Dibble, would you like to explain your motion? Your um, yes, uh, Madam Chair, at the risk of stepping on my good friend and colleagues, uh, Senator Patricia Torres Ray's successful amendment. It changes the nature of the study um, that's called for uh, in uh, uh, section uh, two. Um, and uh, rather than um, uh, simply uh, uh, having a study that's premised, I think, on a, on a false assumption that there is a, a negative consequence to the economic impact of adopting uh, clean car standards. Um, this would actually call for a study that um, the proponents of this bill on this committee themselves have asked for, and it would ask for uh, a study of um, pollution from light duty vehicle use, including direct and indirect costs resulting from the impact of vehicle emissions on human health. It also adds, uh, before I forget, I jumped over it, um, uh, to the authority of the Pollution Control Agency um, uh, to um, direct them uh, to um, reduce all forms of pollution and improve human health. So in their, in their scoping and, and responsibility clause as well. And I would request a roll call vote on this amendment. Oh, and it would also um, require that the study be turned in uh, the early part of next year. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's a lot in these few lines that I'm seeing on the fly here. Um, I definitely take this and try to digest it and understand it more. But for right here and right now, I uh, do not want to adopt this onto the bill. I'd take this back and study it further as it moves through the process. Thank you, members. Are there questions? Secretary will take the roll. Senator Rudin? No. Senator Swadinski? Yes. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Coran? No. Senator Weber? Senator Lang. <laughs> Senator Howe. No. Senator Senjum. No. Senator Matthews. No. Senator Eaton. Yes. Senator Torres Ray. Yes. Senator Carlson. Yes. There being five ayes and seven nays, the motion does not carry. Are there any further discussion? Senator Dibble. Madam Chair, I'd like to request a roll call on the final, the final motion. Roll call has been requested. Roll call will be granted. Is there further discussion on the bill? Madam Chair. Sen then, oh, Senator Matthews. Oh, I'll just make the final motion to refer it to the correct committee then if you're ready. Senator Matthews, I'm going to have Senator Weber mo okay. move the bill if he would. That works too. So moved. All right. Senator moves that Senate File 3496 as amended be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Transportation Committee. All those, oh, a roll call has been requested. The Secretary will take the roll. Senator Rood? Aye. Senator Swidinski? No. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Coran? Aye. Senator Weber? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator Howe? Senator Senjum? Senator Senjum? Senator Matthews? Aye. Senator Eaton? No. Senator Torres Ray? No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Senjum? No. Senjum? Senjum. Senator Senjum. This is, yes, thank you. <laughs> Oh, 
There'd be seven ayes and five nays. The bill is passes as amended. Senator Chamberlain, we have a committee coming in at three. Would you like to present or would you like to wait for another day? Madam Chair and members, I think it's best to wait another day, if you don't mind. Thank you, Senator <coughs> Chamberlain. We certainly appreciate your patience today. Yes. Thank you. Members with no other business before this committee, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>